I hope you can hear me. For some reason, we have not been able to unmute everybody and get everybody to be able to talk to each other. So I hope you didn't leave. Um, so hopefully you can hear us. Kelsey says she can hear me. Um, so we're good. So I'm gonna welcome you all here. Uh, the one problem when I'm here is I don't get to see who's all here with me. So I'm glad you are. I know there are a lot of folks here that are with me. So thank you. As you see, we're in the sanctuary again. We are trying to work things out that we can make this happen, uh, that we have both a live uh, congregation here for those who want to come back here under yellow and uh, our Zoom group. So that's what we're trying to work on, but we seem to keep running into glitches. Hopefully right now you can hear me well enough and see me fine. Uh, what I'm going to do now is what we said we'd like to do for a couple of minutes here, is just sort of walk everybody through what it would look like if you came here under yellow. And we still, we're hoping that we could do that next week, but again, you're gonna have to stand by your emails and phone calls to know for sure, because we, we have to evaluate everything after, after this service again here. Uh, but Matt is out in the Northex, so he should be able to take over now. Is that correct, Matt? I think so. Go ahead. All right, so you're gonna come in the Northex, Either these doors, there's, there will be an usher there, um, or these doors. If you need handicapped uh, parking, uh, this is the entrance you would want to use. You come in, the ushers are going to send you over to an usher here at the front doors, and then uh, you're going to keep on going. They're going to direct you into the usher at the beginning, or in the front of the sanctuary, and they're going to uh, see you. So that's kind of our, our plan. Um, one thing I did forget is there we do have hand sanitizer and disinfectant spray out here. Um, so we're we have we also have some extra masks um, that one of our our members uh, made. So we appreciate that very much. And uh, but if if you can bring your own mask, we we do encourage that. So thank you. And also, we do have our, our offering plate uh, right outside the, or right inside the sanctuary doors, so. Okay. Good for me again. Am I back? Can you hear? All right, good. One of the keys to all this is going to be that, as you saw, uh, our folks in here, we're still going to be required to wear masks in the sanctuary throughout the service. Um, our ushers, like where Kevin was, Kevin's job is going to be, he's going to seat you. He's going to point you to a specific seat. We're going to fill in from the front to the back, and we have, have uh, seats designated so that we're maintaining the uh, six feet of social distance. Um, we're going to be trying to follow all of that. And when we exit the building or exit the sanctuary at the end of the service, again, it won't be a free-for-all, but we will kind of, uh, get you out in an orderly way. So again, there's maintenance of that uh, social distancing. We think we can make that work, but we're, we're still trying to figure out some of the technological things of being in here. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. I appreciate everybody's patience with all this. Um, as you know, the reason we are trying to be really uh, faithful to this is, is we realize there's all sorts of different ideas about when you should come back and how valid everything is, we just know that there is there is a threat out there and we want to make sure everybody's safe. And uh, we think that's an important job that we have in our churches for each other. And so that's why we're going to try to try to maintain this. So we will let you know, ASAP, whether we're going to do this next Sunday in the sanctuary and in other words, have, have the ability for you to come here. Um, if you have any kind of symptoms, please do not come. If you do not want to wear a mask, I'm going to ask you to respectfully not come because we are not, I don't want to put anybody in a position where we feel like we have to confront you and tell you you can't stay. That, that's not nice either. But we're just asking everybody to be respectful uh, to the kind of the rules that we're trying to provide for each other's care and safety. A couple other announcements. Um, again, CCC, our care center, is starting operations again tomorrow. Um, they have been working very hard to get everything clean, uh, disinfected, all sorts of other protocol ready 
We've had to change a number of things around so that we could uh, uh, provide an entrance for the children to be able to get their temps um, and so that we have enough staff to be able to escort them to their own rooms. So the families, the parents are not wandering through the building. It's just our staff and our children. So keep everybody in your thoughts throughout the week as they try to make uh, to navigate all that very well. In the meantime, we've had a wonderful um, uh, influx of helpers to help keep our get our sanctuary, not our sanctuary, as much as our facility up and ready and looking much better. Um, we had a crew, Dina and Angie and their mom and Sydney and Andy, the whole Hornberger crew, Schneider crew. They uh, repainted the, the uh, fellowship hall. Um, which looks wonderful. We had a crew from uh, Dave Dunmoyer to Corey, I guess, and a bunch of other people. I don't remember who all that was. And I said this last week who redid the floors in the, in the fellowship hall and in all the hallways, and they look spectacular. So big thanks to everybody who's been willing to do all, all that. And again, a thank you to all of you for being faithful to coming to this service and being faithful to providing your tithes and offerings throughout these last. Uh, two, two and a half months. Well, it, it has been a wonderful expression of uh, your continued commitment to our church, even though everything's all topsy-turvy. So again, thanks uh, thanks for all of you being here. We are adding the addition. Can you see Philip? Mm -hmm. All right. So Philip is here. Now, what Philip is going to do today, we're, we're going to try to make this service pretty much as it has been, but also what it would be like in the sanctuary. So one of the big things that you may have read in our, um, our email is that right now, the advice that everybody's receiving in churches is they're still advising you not to sing, even with masks on. It's just too much of a projection of germs and all of that. So we still want to be able to involve Philip, so he's going to come and, and offer a prelude. And in the future, not today, but in the future, uh, maybe some special music until we can uh, get back to green and maybe get back to singing. But in the meantime, uh, since we won't be singing in the sanctuary, we're not going to be uh, incorporating the hymns right now into the services. So, uh, but we do what we do. So we're going to start the service, our service of devotion. And uh, again, we know you may not be able to see that screen. We, we think it's better. Is it better today? Um, and uh, I will eventually pray this prayer, but as Philip plays the prelude, I encourage you to get yourself calm. I will get myself calm and relaxed. And uh, if you can read that prayer, read it as a prayer while you're hearing the music, and let ourselves be brought into this time of devotion before God. Let me offer our centering prayer, especially for those of you who are on the phone and can't see it anyway. Humbly, O oh Lord, we bring ourselves to you and each other. Let us bow our hearts before you so that we would be in a position to hear you and honor you. May this be not our time, but your time, O oh merciful one. Amen. So I call us to this time of devotion, this time of being before God and his word. So may we hear God's word this morning. We're not passing the peace at the moment because we're not able to unmute everybody right now for some reason. So we're going to be moving along a little quicker than usual. So I invite you to hear our scripture from Acts chapter 2. Verses 36 to 39. Again, if you can see it on the screen. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God calls to him. And the second reading is Paul's words in Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion or sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accordance and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of God, he add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of it. Speaking of that, I'm hoping you're hearing. I understand there is some up and down with the acoustics. Getting any better, did you know? Okay. Blame the organ, all right. Philip comes one day and we blame the organ. So, the title of my sermon is, You're Full of It. You're full of it. I'm sure you've heard that expression or used that expression. And sometimes the it can be a little bit more specific than it. You know, you're full of baloney, for instance. But we're full of something. So were the disciples. Last week when we read the Pentecost story and we're told that the Holy Spirit came, we're told the Holy Spirit filled the disciples filled everybody that was in that room. They were full of the Holy Spirit. And throughout the New Testament, we read that phrase or some variation of it, that people who are disciples of Jesus or following Jesus, or even as Paul alludes to those who will follow Jesus in subsequent generations, will be filled with the Holy Spirit. They will receive the Holy Spirit. This concept appears in Paul's letters, it appears in Peter's letters, it appears all over the New Testament. But what's most interesting is in the book of Acts, where we start to read about the formation of the church, the formation of us and our heritage. There's at least 10 times where it talks about those people, our heritage and the faith, being filled with the Spirit. In fact, in verse um, in, in Acts chapter 13, verse 52, it actually says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So we as believers in Christ, those of us who have accepted Christ and have started a relationship with Christ, we are told that we have received the Spirit. Again, referring back to Peter's words, at the very beginning of the church, when I just prayed that he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, meaning for everybody after you, that like you, accepts Christ. But the question today then is, to what degree are we full of the Holy Spirit? Paul tells us this, he says, do you not know that you are God's temple 
and that God's spirit dwells in you. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. To what degree do we have this spirit living in us and working itself, himself out of us? He lives in us. That's clear. That's what Paul just said. That's what Jesus has said. That's what Peter says. That's what scripture says. But if the spirit's not working out in us, something else is. We are always full of something. We are always full of either the spirit or we are full of our own stuff. And what I think happens is we have the spirit, but we kind of partition the Holy Spirit off in our life. Kind of seal off the spirit and only open the floodgates of the spirit at certain times. Maybe on a Sunday morning when we're in church and we get nice to each other. And after that, we kind of close the spirit off again. Paul talks about this other stuff in us other than the spirit. He calls that the flesh. He says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. And Jesus said to his disciples, right before they were nodding off to sleep, before they were about to betray him and deny him and desert him and fight for him on all these things in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to them, the spirit indeed is willing. But the flesh, the flesh is weak. So how do we know what we're really full of? We find out what we're full of when we're bumped into, or when, when stuff gets kind of, outside factors kind of get dropped into our life. Then we kind of know what we're full of. I've got, I have a picture, a picture here. So let's imagine, because I didn't want to do this for real or else I'd get bored or whatever all over the place, but let's imagine this is filled to the brim with liquid. You pick in your mind whatever liquid you want. But it's filled to the brim with liquid. See right there. Can we still see that, Corey? Okay. So there it sits, right? Again, full to the brim. So what happens if that pitcher gets shook or bumped into? Well, whatever is up to the brim is going to spill out over, right? What happens if, you know, we drop something into that liquid, a, a rock or a piece of orange or anything, when it's filled to the brim, it's going to spill out over, right? So if we're full of the spirit, then when we get bumped or when stuff comes into our life, we'll spill out over with the spirit. We'll spill out over with the fruit of the spirit, because that's what comes out of the spirit. And we know about that fruit. I talk about it fruit frequently. Paul talked about it in Galatians. It's not my list. It's God's list. It's in Scripture. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When we're filled by the Spirit, that's the stuff that starts to come out of us. When something else comes out of us, when we're bumped, when outside pressures come in, then we know something else is going on. If we're filled by the Spirit, spiritual stuff should be coming in. It's just like if I said to you that last night, in the middle of the night, God came to me and God said he's going to give me, he has given me, he has already given me supernatural powers on the basketball court. If that happened, you would expect to take me right now outside here to a basketball court and you would expect me at five foot eight and 55 years old to be dunking the ball, making every shot, being able to go up and down the court, dribble the ball, perfect. Right? If I told you God gave me that supernatural ability, you would want me to show it to you. And if I showed it to you, then you would believe. Well, we declare that God has indeed given us his spirit. So the world should expect us to be able to show that. That should be spilling out of us at all times. Again, that love and joy, that peace and patience, that kindness and generosity and gentleness and self-control would be spilling out of us. But we know it isn't. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we full of? And how do you know what you're full of? What I'm full of? Back to the picture. 
your life, my life. What happens when other people bump us? What happens when other people's stuff starts to shake us and knock us? What happens when, what happens when other people's stuff comes into our life? starts coming into our world, whether it's through the television, through our doorway, or whatever it is. What happens when we're bumped and pressed in upon by others? And when I say others, what I'm talking about is the others, others. An other in our life, in your life, my life, anybody's life, is typically somebody who is outside of us, outside of our perspective, outside of our way of doing things outside of our approaches and our viewpoints and our thoughts. Somebody who is another is somebody who's different than me in some ways. The other can be your twin brother or sister at times. Other times they're just like you. But when they share or when they express something different than you, they become an other. That's just how we are. So what happens when the other's stuff bumps into you? What comes out? Maybe in another way, let's say it this way. And this is just one way, but what happens to you when you get offended by someone? Back years ago, we used to do, in my other church, we would do uh, uh, adult Sunday school class, and people would bring different books. Sometimes we'd study a, a, a book of scripture. Sometimes we'd study a, a written book that was about scripture or that was about our faith. And uh, we'd study that and, and kind of use it as a guide to discussion. And one day somebody came to me and said, I'd like us to do this book. And the title of the book was The Bait of Satan. The Bait of Satan, you know, like a worm, the bait. I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is going to be about Satanism. This is going to be about the devil and about hell. And not that that's not what we're talking about. It's just so easily sensationalized. So I thought, I don't know. But I said, let me read it. When I read this book by a guy named John Bavari, he made a point I've never heard before, and he made it very well, that when we get offended, that becomes the bait that draws Satan into our life, and we start doing, saying, being things that God would never want us to do, say, and do. When we get hurt and offended, that's when it all comes out. When others bump us, that's when the other things come out. The not so fruit of the spirit, the rotten fruit in our lives. So I want you to consider those whose views and values or approaches or perspectives are different or contrary or the antithesis of your own. At any given time, there's where you see the other. And there's where you find out what's really filling you and how that other bumps up against you. You and I have many others in our life. On any given day, we have several of them. This past week, this past two weeks, we have been inundated with others. For some people, the others, the ones who have a different viewpoint, a different value system, a different setting, a different perspective, a different approach, might be looters. And rioters. The other might have been, might continue to be protesters. The other for you might be President Trump. The other for you might be the Democratic Senate. The other for you this past week might have been the media, it might have been the police, it might have been your neighbor who shared a different thought than you. But when they did, they were the other, and it bumped you, and what came out? What's coming? We open up the newspaper, we turn on the news, we, we turn on Facebook, and there are others all over the place. Bumping us, exposing what we are full of. The other doesn't have to be the drama of, of our you know, world. The other can be political, but the other can be very personal. The other is the black to the white. The other is the Republican to the Democrat. The other is the progressive to the conservative. The dropout to the college graduate. The addict 
to the straight-laced person, the Hatfield, to the McCoy, right? The other is the estranged child to the parent. It's the criminal to the police, the Muslim to the Christian, the atheist to the Christian, the out-of-towner to the local. It's the winner to the loser, the foreigner to the American. It's the kneeler to the pledger. It's Corey to me. It's Dina to me. It's Philip to me. It's Philip to Corey. It's that personal time. When the views and the ways of others bump into me or drop into my life, what comes out? If we're full of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be those fruit and love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Because we do have the spirit in us. It's just that we haven't let the spirit fill us. And Paul tells us what we need to do. We got to empty. We have to empty the self in order to let the spirit fill us. Paul didn't tell us that based on his own self. He said this, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. I used that passage at the beginning of the week with the people doing Bible meditation. I gave some thoughts then a little. But ever since I read that passage, which I've read, I used to read that passage as a, a statement of faith in a church before. We used it like we used the Apostles' Creed. So I'm so familiar with that passage. But boy, did it strike me for this past week. Now, let me just say it this way, and this may not be a popular thing because I think we, we've heard this concept enough that we just don't want to hear it anymore and we don't want to hear it anymore because it probably applies to us and we just would rather not have it apply to us. But here's the thing. And I don't think you can debate me on this. What Paul is saying in our terms today is that Jesus was privileged. I mean, come on. He was in the form of God. He had all the privilege you could possibly have. He had it all. I'm privileged. You're privileged. Just like Jesus. But here's what Jesus did. As it says, he was in the form of God, but not, but did not count that as a thing to be exploited. In other words, he didn't look at others. And he didn't look at life. And he didn't live his life from his privilege. He emptied himself. He got rid of it all and took on the form of a human. He took on the form of the other that technically is underneath him. And he put that other above it. Paul says you have that the mind of Christ who was privileged and could have done anything and been anything, but he chose as our savior to put others here and die for them. And then Paul says, so, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Again, the others isn't the person next door to you that you really like. He might be another, but the other is, again, parallel to Jesus being God and then becoming one of us. The other is that person that really is in your mind, in your mind, not like you. And maybe even if you're willing to get on your knees and confess it, less than you. That person you say, if that were me, I would never do that. I would never think that. That person to whom you say they're wrong, they're bad. In these terms, they're the other. 
And when they bump us, yeah, our bad stuff comes out. So we got to empty ourselves as Jesus did all the time when we're dealing with others. We got to be willing to take our stuff and kind of empty it out so that we can listen and, and respect those who Jesus died on the cross for. Me and the others. That's what it is to be filled with the Spirit. Paul goes on to say that because Jesus did this, because he emptied himself of all that godliness and put others above him and to die for them, because he did that, his name is above all names. In other words, his name, not only is he the perfect example, but other places in Scripture says he's our judge. What that means is not so much that Jesus is going to sit there and he's going to judge us with a gavel and a wig. It means that Jesus is the measurement by which we are judged. He is the example. He is the judge. But most importantly, as I think I said last week, he is the first and the last say in everything about everyone. So we empty ourselves so that the spirit of Christ, the spirit of Christ that is the name of all names, the ways of Christ, take the forefront. Which reminds me of one other, maybe just slightly diversional point, but I, I just can't help but have to make this. Because it reminded me about me. So anytime me, I, Anytime I, or any of us, puts ourselves behind God's word, identifies ourselves with God's church, the body of Christ, unless we're about to talk about the ways of Jesus and to exemplify the ways of Jesus and show the ways of Jesus, then I, we, whoever, needs to cease and desist. We don't get to talk about Jesus unless we're showing because. His is the name above all names. So unless what I say in my reflections on scripture and what I do living out that scripture, unless what I say in my reflection of being the leader of the body of, of a body of Christ here and what I do as that leader or what I say as somebody who claims to be a Christian and what I do as a Christian, unless those things show Jesus, and have Jesus at the heart of the matter, then I don't talk about the church. If it's not going to be about Jesus, I don't get to talk about church, I don't get to talk about the Bible, I don't get to talk about the English. When the Spirit is in us, Christ is the name above all names, and even when the Spirit's not for us, He still is that name. When we have the Spirit living in us, Christ shines. And it shows in how we look at and how we interact with and how we think about the others in our life. When they come bumping into us or when they get pushed into our lives in some way or another. The fuller we are of the Spirit, the more the things of God come out. So whatever you or I need to empty myself of in terms of my ability to look at others from the eyes of Christ and to be able to reflect the fruit of the Spirit, then I need to work at getting that stuff out, emptying me out so I can reflect Christ in and through. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have drawn us together here this morning in this way, that you continue to nudge us enough that we could go through any kind of technical difficulties or whatever to just stay by each other and sit around, stand around, walk around wherever we are around your word and reflections on it. I pray that anything that I have been saying here, just as I said at the end, if anything that I'm saying here is not a reflection of you, then don't let it get in any of our hearts. Don't let it get in any of the, the flaws and the cracks of our of our being just let it go away but i trust lord that your spirit has spoken to us today from your word 
that I have been faithful and true to it. We want to be. The Spirit is willing. We want to reflect the Spirit of Christ. But it's hard when we live in this world that has so much stuff that just rubs us the wrong way. When people just rub us the wrong way. And I will confess for myself, and then if I can, for everybody else here, but I'll just confess for me that people really rub me wrong sometimes. But it's in that where I find out how much I've let you love me or not. Your spirit is you loving us. And when we don't let you love us, we don't let that fruit out. So help us to allow you in, to allow you to love through our own junk so that you, Lord, can start spilling out as we encounter life, as we encounter the news, as we encounter one another virtually, physically, as we encounter the others that we will encounter in about 10 minutes, because that's just how it goes. So help us to be strong in you. We pray for this country, as we know there's so much division, and we know there's so much trouble, and we know there's so much turmoil, and, and we're at the brink of people coming up with different ideas and different thoughts and different views. Again, we can't help but have our own. But let none of our own thoughts and views and perspectives get in the way of letting the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control shine through us into this needy world. We just pray for each other. We haven't been able to see each other and know what everybody's going through. I do lift up this morning and didn't get to share this, that Linda Meckley is in the hospital and Lord, we just join together right now that you would, uh, and pray that you would just be with her, keep her, uh, keep her strong in spirit and getting stronger in body so that she uh, might be able to get home soon. Each of us knows others in our life that are struggling and going through hard times. They're the, the others that are easier for us to talk to you about, but we do anyway, because we know you love them. So those who are going through hardships and struggles, in life right now, physically, emotionally, relationally. Those among us who right now can put a finger right on the others that we're having a hard time with, help us to get a different vantage point, the one of Christ himself. We want to be your church. We want to be a light in your community, in our nation, in your world. So we pray for each other. We pray for our brothers and sisters all around us who are trying to be faithful in the midst of everything that's happening. Keep us faithful to you and bless us by your love. And hear us as we pray together in our own homes, but together as one voice, the prayer you taught us in Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I want to remind you again, are we going to be able to unmute everybody now or no? So they're not going to get to talk to each other. Okay. So I want to remind you all that as we work through all this stuff, we were hoping perhaps very, maybe even next week, to be able to have a live worship in here. Be aware of your emails, and we'll try to phone those who maybe aren't as, uh, online as much or not at all. And uh, we'll try to keep you mindful of what's, uh, what's coming up here and what's happening. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, keep coming back to us, and uh, we're going to try to fix these glitches that just suddenly arose here for us today that weren't here before. We're sorry you're not going to get to unmute and talk to me. Take you, take the spirit, let the spirit move you. Take Jesus and let wherever you go, so that the spirit might spill out of you wherever you are. Amen. Unmute yourselves and talk because we think you actually can do it on your own. Blessings to you for the day.